So, hello and welcome to the Benefit Workshop today. I hope that you're having a good day in the Compass event today and you learn a lot and uh, and, and get a lot of um, thoughts and, and enjoy the session of today. Uh, today, we are, I'm going to facilitate this, this workshop today uh, and, and introduce David Waller, which is the Senior Benefits Manager in NHS England. And my name is Blanca Garcia Plazas. I'm the Corporate Benefits Manager in Haiti. And today we are all going to talk about uh, the um, benefits framework, what it's about. And at the end of the session, we are going to give you some uh, um, view of how we can help you from the HPCA and the organization to implement benefit uh, benefits management in your organization. Uh, what would be the benefit of being a, a member of, uh, of the HPCA and what you will get in terms of benefit. If you don't mind, I will hand it over to David and he will tell you everything about the framework. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hopefully uh, you'll see a PowerPoint slide benefits realization framework. Um, if you do, then it means at least I'm pressing the right buttons. My name is David Waller. I'm benefits management business partner, I think is my job description in the transformation portfolio office at NHS England. So I basically go around and interfere with other people's benefits management. I'm the man from head office and I'm here to help you. Um, so I work with colleagues who are benefits managers and people who are interested in starting benefits management or, or developing and you know, improving on it. Um, and most of my job, I suppose, is looking for common good practice so that I can then share it around with, with other people. What I'm going to cover through the slides is the realization framework, which is sort of a document. Um, what I don't want to do is turn this into a chalk and talk session. The slides are mainly there to remind me for the next thing to say, so they're more for my benefit than yours. However, it means that I can't really see if anybody puts their hand up. I want this to be discussion and chatting and the rest of it, but please shout or wave and Blanca will interrupt me and, and tell me to pause for a second or two and let people talk. Um, so without further ado, I'll leap into it. As it says, it's managing benefits at a portfolio and programme level. So we're looking for good benefits in a general frame. Right. Um, I'm guessing that just about everybody on this call benefits manager or is aware of benefits, so I'm not going to go into detail about this. Simple thing about benefits as a definition, positive stakeholders. Who are the stakeholders we're talking about? What do they perceive to be worthwhile? Is you know, Who's it really for? What do they actually want? Are two key noddy questions that run throughout benefits management. And although the, the, the framework is a bog standard, boring book, those two questions still sort of echo through it. Who is it really for and what do they actually want? So the purpose of the framework outlines the rules and regulations of managing benefits at a portfolio and program level, how they should be categorized, quantified, valued and validated. How do we know that they are good benefits and sensible benefits? We want the framework to apply to all centrally funded investment programs. So it, it's a, a document that is being promoted throughout NHS England. We would like it to be promoted throughout the NHS as well. You know, if you haven't got a framework, here's one that you can use. So I suppose my first question is, has anybody got a benefits realisation framework document of their own at the moment? Nobody waving their hands or anything like that? So Chad is saying that they don't have anything in Yorkshire ambulance. So the majority of the que of the answer in the chat is it says no. So I okay. presume that it's a, it's a good thing for you. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't tell me where I'm going wrong. Brilliant. Um, <laughs> except you can. This, this is not a perfect document. There are elements of it that every time I read it, I think, that's not quite right. We can improve on that. So I welcome your feedback as I talk about stuff in here. Say, hang on, what does that mean? Or do you really need to do it that way? Now, let's see how we go. 
So the first thing it does is it sets a, a group of standards. You know? so what we're looking for is common good practice rather than everybody rushing off and doing things in their own separate way. We need to set the scene and say, OK, these are the basic ground rules that, that we need to, to see for, for any program to do with benefits. So programs should be evidence based. Right? Um, I suspect that most of you are on the Steve Jenner call at, at lunchtime. Um, I missed this morning, so I don't know if this has been covered by other people, but you know, it's pretty self-evident that we need to know that we're not just making stuff up. You know, there's got to be justification, reasons, and some sound evidence behind the decisions that we make. So let's look for evidence in the first place. All programs should be benefits-led, focusing on the realization and validation that contribute to strategic objectives. Personally, I think all programs should be strategy led and benefits contribute to strategic objectives. But because we come from a history where we never even thought about the benefits properly anyway, this is a good halfway house. It's still not quite perfect in my view, but actually having something that says, hang on, we really need to think about the benefits is better than where we were before. Focus on actively searching for benefits, searching for them to make sure we're finding the good ones and the valid ones, not the searching for them to justify the program. Yeah. Again, going back to what Steve Jenner was, was, was talking about, you know, with, with the biases and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. We're not here to rush around with a clipboard afterwards to justify somebody in authority buying the big shiny thing. Right. Active searching is active searching for good benefits, you know, doing it for the right reasons. Transparent forecasting and reporting. I'm coming at this from a portfolio point of view. So what I want to know is benchmarking and, and how programs are performing against one another. Now, if, if we're giving everybody 10 million pounds a piece, who's giving us the biggest bang for our buck? And are we spending that money in the right place? Should we be tweaking things, you know, um, encouraging success, you know, reinforcing success and that sort of thing? So transparent forecasting and reporting, you know, being honest about what you think you can get in the first place, being honest about what you're achieving in practice. Uh, and again, clear line of sight. Uh, and programs should be forward looking, emphasis on continuous learning. Uh, how are we doing? How can we do better? OK, anybody got any comments? Not at the moment. Right. Uh, okay. Just asking for the slide. I think that we will share them. Yeah. Yes, they they will be available, um, and if we give you the PowerPoint rather than a PDF, there are some speakers' notes on some of the slides, which may explain some of the notes in in more detail. You know, just in case I forget to mention something. So if they're evidence based, okay, aligning your benefits with strategy. Um, most of our stuff is done on the Treasury's five case model for business cases. You know, so so there's the uh, strategic, financial, economic, commercial, and management cases. And the strategic case is the bit where you should say, this is why this is important. You know, this is the picture of the world that we are working in. Um, you know, it may be specific. It may be dealing with outpatients across the country, or it may be dealing with integration of IT systems or, or, or the fitting of fiber into the ground or whatever. But you know, let's set the boundary about What's the strategy that we're dealing with to make sure that our benefits actually align with that strategy? You know, we're doing this because um, I keep coming back to, to Jenna because he, he kept mentioning some useful things. Um, he said thing about you know, transformation. Yeah? Oh, God, everybody says transformation, but they don't actually say what they're transforming. I've seen programs in the past where it's digital transformation with the most vague and woolly description of what digital transformation means. You know, so what will we do? We will do things digitally. We will use the power of the internet. You know, what the hell does that mean? What are the benefits? Um, um, Blanca gets five minutes a day free time. I get three pounds a day savings in cost. Now, they become penny packet little treats for people to play nicely with one another so that the program can continue. What they don't do is make a direct contribution to the strategic change. You know, if the strategic change is to cut waiting lists 
in outpatients by 25% in five years, then the benefits are going to be something along the lines of you know, opening up capacity within the trusts, reducing the number of appointments that patients need to go to unnecessarily, if you can need to do something unnecessarily, you know, that sort of thing. It ties in, you can see where the benefit links to the objective, links to the vision, external drivers and so on. Yeah. Often what we end up with is in business cases, what I call affinity marketing. You know, like they, they, they put pictures of Star Wars characters on boxes of cornflakes to encourage you to buy the cornflakes. <laughs> Star Wars has got nothing to do with cornflakes, but hey, you know, that looks good. You know, I'll buy the cornflakes. The strategic case in a lot of business cases is, oh, NHS long term plan, um, you know, sort of the data strategy, AI strategy, whatever. What are you going to do? I'm going to link the records from this hospital to that hospital and make sure that the machines can talk to one another. Yeah. There's a huge gap between the NHS long term plan and swapping a record between hospitals. So aligning with strategy is desperately important and stuff we, we don't do as well as we could. And the other one is obviously the start with the end in mind. You know, that is the mantra of benefits management. So identify what the end is that you're actually talking about before you go off and do the stuff. Getting into the boring stuff. Um, OK, so, so we, we, we talked about sort of strategy and standards, uh, the overarching stuff. This is getting into the, the little bit about comparing benefits against one another. Um, the valuation and the validation is issues of benefits management. We categorize them into these four types. Um, and the reason why we do that is so that we can compare our apples with apples and our oranges with oranges. Yeah. Cash releasing benefit, you know, a hard cash saving, a bill you won't get anymore, something that can be cut from somebody's budget, you know, bookable benefits. And the non-cash stuff, uh, efficiencies, productivity gains. Yeah. Back to the business about vouchers, you know, time saving is a voucher. It's what you choose to do with it that turns it into the benefit, but still measured in money terms. Yeah. It, when all else fails, it's how many hours at whatever rate. The societal benefits, what's in it for society beyond the public sector of health and social care? You know, what, who, what are the benefits to people who don't work for the NHS? Again, in money terms, but we're doing this for patients. We're doing this for the general public. We're doing it for service users and carers in social care. Yeah. What do they get out of it? What's it worth to them? Yeah. And can we put a value on it? Yeah. And we must put a value on it. And the qualitative ones are the ones where that value can't be money, but it's still measurable. Yeah. If it's an improvement in patient satisfaction, you know, it's measuring it in, we scored eight out of 10 last month, we want to score nine out of 10 next month. Uh, invariably, qualitative benefits tend to be, well, we'll do something better. It will enable. You know, there are some dreadfully phrased quality benefits if we don't think about measurement terms. Hence, the, you know, the, put it in the framework to try and encourage people to do that. On the disbenefits and the emergent benefits, you should all be familiar with. And I'm still talking and nobody's come back to me. Uh, there is a, a comment in the chat, um, David, right. about the, the strategy. Chad is saying that in times of crisis or high demand, the focus on programs may switch away from realizing longer term strategy strategies to focus on maximizing current output service delivery short term. Yeah, but that's a strategic choice that has to be made, isn't it? So, so yeah. strategy doesn't have to be sort of time bound as in sort of anything that long, goes beyond five years is strategic. Anything that happens in the next six months is tactical. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's still doing stuff for the right reasons and doing that in the best way. That's what strategy ought to be about. Um, I suppose one of the issues with the start with the end in mind is there is always the danger that you put it in tablets of stone and don't change it. You know, we decided to do something, that's it. We're going to do it regardless of how the situation changes. Um, 
know, we're, we're going to put stuff in place. Oh, well, COVID's happened. Well, never mind. We're still going to go and spend a shed load of money on something that nobody can use because they're all locked in their houses for the next two years. Yeah. There is another question yeah. in the chat, David. It's really good. Yeah. Is that this benefit? Is this benefit risks to benefit? No, th th this benefit is a disadvantage to a stakeholder. Right? So, so if a cash releasing benefit is I save money, a cash releasing disbenefit is it costs me money and it continues to cost me money. Now, it, it's an encumbrance that is going to happen for as long as a benefit could happen. Um, it's not a risk to missing the benefit. It's simply the bad mirror image of benefits. So, so you can have sort of um, qualitative disbenefits of you know, it makes me more miserable. You know, I, I, I get seen quicker, I get treated quicker, but the actual service that is delivered to me is brusque, abrupt by nasty people. And frankly, my patient satisfaction goes down because of it. It's that sort of thing that, that we're looking for for disbenefits. And, and it's important to consider them. Um, because otherwise you're not trading them off against the benefit. And you think, oh, this program's brilliant. We, we get this, that, and the other. Yeah. But actually there's an awful lot of stuff happening on the side that spoils it, but we're not going to talk about that. You know, the benefit, I save a load of money. The disbenefit, five of you are now out of a job. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's got to be viewed that way. There is another question for emergent benefit, David. It says, could you say more about emergent benefit in digital programs? It might be hard to get a handle on quantify the benefit up from, especially in the agile environment. <laughs> yeah, um, an emergent benefit, I suppose, sort of the, the, the simple definition is it's one that isn't in the business case. You identify a lot of benefits up front when you're planning and writing a program brief, writing a business case that justify that you know, the program is worthwhile. And then as life goes on and things happen, you discover new benefits that you hadn't thought about and they emerge. With Agile, because it is that continuous treadmill of change, you know, sort of sprint, make a change, implement a change, what happens next? Frankly, you know, everything could be an emergent benefit. Um, and I think to some extent we haven't worked out how benefits management as a business method works tidily with agile. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then again, with agile, you're spending money on that cycle process as well. Yeah. So if you're having to revise your costs because your estimates are changing, then yeah, emergent benefits and emergent costs fit into that, at which point I'm probably slipping into waffle, so I'm going to move on to the next one. But it, it, it is something that's open to debate at the moment. I don't, I don't think there's a, a standard answer to that one. Yeah, it's, it says, uh, there is a, just a more question, David, in mm -hmm. there. It's um, eager to understand more about emergent benefit too, assuming they will be one of the five types. Yeah, yeah. Um, emergent benefits are just ones that happen after the business case was written. So you know, by category, they can be cash or non-cash or societal or whatever. It's mm -hmm. just simply a question of timing that makes it emergent. Yeah. I hope that, that answers your question, Laura. That's it. We don't have any. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks. Right, so it's so valuing and praising. Okay, we, we, we've got categories of benefit um, and it's important to do the categories because we often do it wrong you know, people will assume oh it's got something to do with money it must be cash releasing and it isn't yeah. um, or, or, or we sort of look at benefits that we are for patients which should be societal and we say oh it's non-cash releasing it's a benefit to the trust no it isn't because they don't actually see any money or, or, or see any value out of it so, so this is why we try to put the standards in and the categorization so that people are talking about similar benefits in similar ways. Um, likewise, the value and appraising bit is uh, how much does it cost to get this benefit? You know, how much is the value of the benefit compared to the cost? 
that way, as it says here, it informs our options analysis. Yeah. If within the business case, you know, you've got the three, four shortlisted options, you can compare the costs against the benefits, and therefore that helps you decide which is the option to take. If you can't quantify or value your benefits, then how can you make that decision? Yeah. Um, the other one to mention on that one, quality of life, is pulled out as a specific in that what we're doing is improving patient outcomes to a great extent. Therefore, we ought to be measuring that. And we don't. We don't do it half as often or half as well as we could do. Uh, the quality adjusted life year or quality is basically the currency of the NHS. What we do is create quality of life. You know, we, we make people better, faster. You know, we, 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 we take away their pain and their sickness. And you know, that's basically what we're about. So we ought to be able to measure that. And officially, there are ways of doing it, qualities, EQ, 5D scores, and all that sort of stuff. We do it, you know, nice do it for drugs and all that sort of thing. In IT, we don't, and we really ought to. If we're spending money on an IT system that could otherwise be spent on more nurses or bandages or pills, we ought to be comparing what we achieve in the way that they can compare see how they achieve stuff you know they improve the quality of care how do we improve the quality of care um more boring paperwork okay planning should extend beyond the life of the initial program funding yes you know the benefits are not going to appear for years no? some of them may begin to appear as soon as you switch on the piece of kit but that's unlikely if we're talking about things where it's changing long-term um, well-being, you know, sort of scanning, screening, vaccination, stuff like that, it's going to take years before we can see the results. Yeah. Um, therefore, we need to say that we're planning for benefits after the programme team have packed up and gone home and it's all moved into live service. Yeah. Therefore, we need to work out, one, how we're going to forecast them in the first place to make sure they're reasonable. You know, back to Steve and his £600 million pounds worth of, uh, whatever it was, sort of Wi-Fi into schools in Australia. Yeah. How far do the ripples extend? How far does our, our sort of boundary of control extend that we can say, yeah, that's up to us and it will happen for the next five years or 10 years and we're confident in it. And how are you going to manage it and report on it? Yeah. Um, if the National Audit Office are coming back in five years' time to say, you know all that money you spent, what happened to it? How do you know? Have you actually got something within your programme plan that says, yeah, for the next 10 years, some sad person with a clipboard is going to go around and count stuff? Or better still, you know, it's into the KPIs and it's into the normal performance management systems of the people who use it. But nonetheless, it's still being tracked. Benefits are artifacts. An artifact in this case is a document. You know, it's a piece of paper or, or a, a virtual document on a screen. Benefits management strategy. How are you going to do benefits within your program? Right. Framework describes the overall, this is how we as an organization worry about our benefits management. Benefits management strategy is how are we actually going to apply that in practice to this individual program? Benefits network, logic model, theory of change. A diagram that shows how it all fits together. Um, benefits dependency networks or benefits map. Right? My favorite tool in the whole methodology of benefits management. Right? If you're new to benefits and you've not seen anything before, the thing to really get your teeth into is mapping. Yeah? Means, ways, ends, what you have, what you use, what you get. It's a tremendous tool, and you know, there's a whole other lesson to it to be had on that one. But the alternatives are things like logic models or theory of change, something that describes you know, why you're doing it and how what you're doing works to get to the why. The benefit profile, one for each benefit, 
in a benefits map, your benefit is described as a phrase. You know, it, it, it's enough to put on a post-it note. The profile is the form that gives you the meat behind that benefit that says we've thought it through properly. You know, here are our workings in the calculation. Here is the, the connection with what the program will deliver. Most importantly, here's the named individual who's responsible to see that this happens. That's the sort of thing that we need within benefits profiles. And the realization plan is gathering it all together. You know, it's a plan. It's like the rest of your project plan. Yeah. It's not sometimes you see a benefits realization plan and it's basically a spreadsheet. It's just simply a line per profile. That's a register. Right? The realization plan, you know, delivering the benefits is, is as important, if not more so, than delivering the kit. Therefore, it warrants having the same amount of planning and worry going into it. And that must then, have triggered a few questions. Yeah, Jody has his uh, hand up. Jody. Hello. Um, so what I'm struggling to articulate is, so you've got some benefits artifacts there, which I think are very useful, but the one that I just can't find, I guess, is the relationship between each individual benefit to the return on the investment in the first place. So, you know, where like, if one of your benefits was that you would be able to see more patients within a service because you're going to recruit 50 more staff, for example, mm -hmm. that is 80% of the return of the investment. Do you know what I mean? Without yeah. that benefit, the other 20% doesn't matter because actually you're so reliant on it is so it's so heavily weighted to one benefit versus all the other benefits. But I struggle to find a tool that doesn't rely on people's opinions to evidence that. Right. OK, um, the way I use it is the benefits register. Um, I have things ordered so that everything's on a spreadsheet because it's easier to, to run on a spreadsheet. I haven't got access to databases and the rest of it. Spreadsheet, one tab per benefit as a profile. So the benefit profile sits as a tab on the spreadsheet. And at the front is a tab with the register and the summary of all the benefits, which I can then sort and filter to fit. You know, so if I've got a dozen benefits, I can look down the list. I can sort them in scale order, you know, which is the biggest, stick it to the top, um, sort them by cash, non-cash, societal, whatever. That gives you the tool to play around with it and come back to people and say, yeah, look, this is what's happening. Um, I've just gone through an exercise at the portfolio level, looking at the benefits out of business cases. And I've got this pretty big benefits register at the moment with the benefits out of sort of 30, 40 programs. And we can see that there is one program that is going to, well, deliver an awful lot of benefit due to sepsis management across hospital trusts. So, so not only is that one bit, one single benefit that far outweighs everything within that program, that single benefit is virtually half the monetized benefits for the entire portfolio that I'm looking at. And if we're not taking that one seriously, then you know, we are in serious bother. That's why you need this sort of thing to, to be able to, to do that comparison, that benchmarking that says, you know what, out of all this lot, We've got nothing that's looking at CO2. Now, where's our net zero principles gone on this one? We're missing a trick. We need to do it. That's why you know, we need these artifacts and we need something in a register that enables you to do that comparison. Have I waffled too much on that one? <laughs> no, what did we have? That's good. Thank you. Thank you. Chad has another question. Thank you. Just, um, th thank you. Really interesting. Just a practical point uh, on the last uh, point on the slide there, the benefits realisation plan. So in project world, so any project managers on the line, it's really important at closure, so at, the end of, at the end of delivery, to work with the business to put in place those practical tasks and activities that happen six months later, 12 months later, uh, and agree ownership for who's going to practically monitor and manage those realisation that benefit realisation uh, 
yeah, benefits of realisation, can't talk. Um, yeah. But I see it as a, an essential activity in the to-do list for a project manager at closure with program manager in this case, because yeah. that's the last chance you probably refresh the benefits plan, realisation plan, but make it part of your day job and part of closure to go through the motions to ensure somebody will be monitoring, measuring, validating. Because um, if, if, if you don't do that, nobody else is you know, looking out for benefits, you just wasted another project, you know, or can't exactly. demonstrate the good work. Um, sorry, I'm rambling. In fact, you come to the next slide. Oh. Brilliant piece of timing. Right. This is a fairly noddy statement. Benefits realisation depends on the effective management of change. Now, the fact that I've pulled it onto one separate slide on its own reinforces what's just been said. Right. Um, we need something... <laughs> It doesn't have to be the benefits managers who do this. Yeah? Within MSP, you've got the technical project manager and you've got the business change manager yeah? who are peers within in the system, one of whom delivers the kit to time, cost and quality. The other one that makes sure that the organisation can actively use that kit properly to deliver the benefits that it's all about. Um, so the benefits realisation plan... Right? To some extent, it's a backstop. All this stuff ought to be done within the business change management stuff. Yeah. The, the transition planning that says you know, we've got to educate and train the staff into the new ways of working, and we've got to time it with everything else that's happening. Um, the implementation um, and the handover to live service. You know, this, this is a system. It's now going to get handed over to people whose day job it is to do the work. Therefore, they've got to be trained. They've got to do the handovers, you know, so the, the, the lead in, the, the, the floor walking, all that sort of stuff. And they're also responsible for the ongoing delivery of that benefit and the tracking and the monitoring and all the rest of it, because it ought to be part of their basic business performance management. Yeah. Um, too often, it's down to somebody at the program level coming back afterwards saying, does it still work? Are you still using it? When in effect, what it really ought to be is somebody whose day job it is to, to run the system to say, this is one of my key performance indicators nowadays, or it's a measure that I still have to take interest in and make sure it gets managed. Um, so yeah, a bit of waffle there, but realization depends on effective management of change. Otherwise, I'm just playing with hypotheticals. You know, If I give you this shiny piece of kit, look at all the opportunities it opens to you. Unless somebody actually does something about it, those opportunities are going to be missed. So review and reporting. Okay, um, as I said, you've got to be accountable, sort of attribute spend against the business case. You know, this is, we gave you lots of money, was it wise? Should we have given you that money? Yes, because I've spent it wisely, and here is my evidence. Um, yeah, benefits realised over five, ten years. Um, if you're building a new hospital, it's sixty. Yeah. So, realisation and reporting continue over the full forecast of the benefits. Already mentioned that. As life progresses, things will change, and your business case forecast. Yeah. When you come to look at it five years hence, when you're still rolling stuff out, life has moved on a lot since then. So you've always got to keep an eye on, is that still a sound forecast? Am I within tolerance, you know, plus or minus 10% or whatever, it's okay. Or the world has changed so much, we've got new opportunities, or you know, COVID's come along and shut everything down, that we need to reforecast the thing. You know, business case isn't going to happen anymore. Let's look at the new opportunities. Is it still worth doing? Now, if it is, fine, carry on. But don't go looking for stuff that is never, ever going to happen anymore. And the final element of there is evaluation. It's not just a question of measuring the, the benefits. You know, sort of, did we get the £10 a person times, uh, money save and stuff like that? Consider the evaluation of the programme project as a whole. In simple terms, it's the lessons learned exercise. You know, if you're doing something big, if, if you're at sort of expensive program level, then it's bringing in somebody 
potentially academic to, to do the full blown evaluation of not only did it work and give us what we wanted, how did it work in practice? How well did we work with one another? You know, were good decisions made? Could we have done better? Looking at that continuous improvement bit right at the beginning, you know, how do we know how we did things so that we can look to do them better in future? So consider the evaluation of the program as a whole, as well as just the quick count the benefits. You know, have we got all the loose change that we expected? David, you have. Oh, yeah. I think that there is a question for that slide. Actually, uh, it says, "Who is accountable for the benefit realization management once agreed, and how often so should they review it?" Right. Which brings me to the next slide: roles and responsibilities. <laughs> okay. SRO, senior responsible owner, um, is accountable for the benefits of their program. Um, and accountability is not something you can delegate. You can delegate responsibility. You know, you can give it to someone and say, hey, you go away and do this for me. But the person at the top of the office, you know, so the, the responsible owner, the sponsor or, or whatever, they're the ones that wanted this to happen. They are accountable for the benefits being delivered. Yeah. Um, beneath them, you've got things like operational benefit owners, right? A benefit owner is someone who is responsible for ensuring that the benefit happens. So it ought to be somebody with line management responsibility, somebody who's got skin in the game as far as the business change is concerned. Yeah. Somebody who works in the project team cannot be a benefit owner because once the project's closed, they've gone. Yeah. They, 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 they can't possibly control the benefit of something that's happening two years after they stopped working for the organization. So it's got to be somebody local, somebody who, as I say, has potentially line management experience and, and, and responsibilities. Yeah. And the responsible owner is the one that ought to be sort of prodding them. You know, so how's it going, guys? Are we still getting it? Are we getting some more? You know, what else can you get me? The other line in there that tends to get forgotten are the beneficiaries. Yeah. Who is it that actually gets the benefit? And so often patients get the benefits. So who's going to say that it's happened? If the owner is someone who is actively managing it, the beneficiary is somebody who can sign off to say that the job's good, it's happened. The acceptance criteria have been met. Maybe the same person. If it's a an admin process or it's a clinical process where the clinician themselves is actively involved, they can own the process and benefit from it. If it's something for patients or service users or, or the wider public, you need a representative. You know, get somebody from the local charity. You know, so if you're dealing with a project to do I don't know, so people with diabetes, then get somebody in from Diabetes UK as, as a user rep and say, you know, tell us, you know, when the people that talk to you are happy with this, we know that we've achieved it. And, and the fact that they're actively involved in the middle of saying, hang on, this is the benefit that I want. I don't want that benefit. I want this benefit instead. Yeah. User involvement. Uh, um, we don't do enough of it. Everybody keeps telling us we really actively involve the users. Beneficiaries are the ideal people to get involved in this. Right. And then service owners and product owners. You know, um, product owners, if you're doing product management within your agile and stuff like that. What are you building? How do you know it's the right product? How do you know to improve it so it gives your customers what they want? Yeah. And when it's in life service, a service owner, you know, is it still working as it ought to do? Is it giving the value it should? And then the benefits manager and evaluation sort of sit underneath all this because yeah, I'm there to provide guidance on the methodology and, and improving good benefits. I'm not there to roll up my sleeves and make sure that you know, somebody's turned up and put all the PCs on the desks that were meant to be there. Yeah. Um, I'm a subject matter expert, therefore my expertise is what you want. Likewise, the evaluation, it's somebody coming from outside who can give you that honest, dispassionate view of how things went. Quick bit on models. I mentioned Benefits network, logic model, theory of change. Yes, 
for goodness sake, put something in there. Yeah. This is a very simple generic benefits map. Yeah. Right hand side, the strategy side of things, driver, something to be fixed, problem statement, you know, sort of instructions from above. What's the objective you want to achieve? A result with a purpose. You know, we will put this kit in by Wednesday because it will cure people of diabetes in Barnsley you know, who come with whatever condition that, that they've come with. Benefit, result with a value. You know, stakeholder, perception of value. You know, 20 patients will get home a day quicker because of this. But then you've got means and ways. The, the ways how stuff gets used in practice. So imagine this picture has been the to be statement. When everything's up and running, we'll have useful pieces of kit. The blue means they will get used in new ways of working in the ways which will result in benefits that meet our objective. And the solution is just simply the bit that sets the boundaries to say, this is what the project's about. It's not curing the whole NHS. It's just doing something for diabetes patients in Barnsley. So as it says, understand the programme delivers outcomes to realise benefits, either as a picture like this or as a logic model or as a theory of change, whatever you're comfortable with, so long as you do it, do it well and reiterate. Yeah? Go back, have another look at it, sleep on it, come back. Yeah? Don't just sort of spend half an hour, let's knock up a benefits map, that's it, job's done. Think about it. The, the, the upfront thinking that, that Steve mentioned again the, at lunchtime, spend enough time at the beginning to work out what you're doing and why. That way you're doing a good thing rather than just rushing to deliver stuff that really hasn't been thought through. And I'm running out of time. So value for money, I'll skip through optimal resources, right? That's what the NAO say it's about. Value for money ratio includes your non-cash and societal cost, their money terms. Within NHS Digital in England, we had this four to one ratio, four pound benefit for every pound spent. Simple story behind that is, going back to qualies, we know how much it costs the NHS to make a quali, you know, the amount of effort we put into it to deliver one extra quality of care. We know what a quality is worth to people. You know, if you say, what would you pay for a quality? Comparing those things, the value that we create compared to the spend that we put in is four to one, right? So if you spend a pound anywhere in the NHS, you ought to be getting four pounds worth of benefit, you know, back to the nurses and the tablets and et cetera. So if that's happening elsewhere, that ought to be our hurdle rate. You know? If we're not getting a four pounds for every pound we spend, we're destroying value and we're wasting money that would be better spent elsewhere. Final bits, net zero, this is new, um, you know, net zero, greener NHS, therefore put something in your business case, think about it. Likewise, health inequalities. Uh, inequalities, major issue. You know, pe people in Blackpool die 10 years sooner than people in Richmond, Surrey or, or whatever it is. You know, what can we do about that? Think about it when looking for benefits. Likewise, the triple aim. Within the NHS long-term plan, it say it doesn't actually define exactly what this is, but it says when you're doing stuff and spending money, think about its impact on the health and well-being of people. That's you know, um, screening, vaccinations, population health stuff. Think about the way it delivers quality of service to individuals and sustainable and economic use of NHS resources. You know, do it as cheaply as you can. So if, if you're struggling for objectives or, or, or drivers for your program, think about these three you know, as almost a backstop measure. You know, what, what can you do that looks at these? So summary, choosing the right things to do for the right reasons. Framework outlines the rules and regulations. You know, it's not mandatory, but it helps. Yeah. And it says program should be benefits led. Think about the value for money and the triple aim. And I realise I'm running late. So training. We have three sessions at the moment, one of which Blanca does, the introduction to benefits, which she can explain when I finish talking about this bit. 
but it's run virtually, so easy to get to. Every month we run one essentials and one intermediate course. Um, either in Leeds or London, the essentials is one day for people who need to know about benefits management, but it's not necessarily going to be their day jobs. And the intermediate is for people who are more actively involved in benefits. You know, if you you are a benefits manager or you are going to be working to or with one and you need to understand how they do their jobs, it's worth going on that. And the yeah. links are already in the, the website, so you go away and have a look at those in your own time. And that is basically it. So I will stop sharing at that point and... Yeah, we're just on the point and I, I just want to add that thank you everybody to come in uh just to add um from haiti and from haiti pca what we are offering you we really want you to implement benefit and embrace the the benefit culture so a part of the training that is a, a basic training we provide as well workshop where we run where you bring your own project and we run a workshop for you i'm here to make everybody's life easier so we got template we facilitate the, the framework we have like um, a collaboration tool to um, work all together so we really want to be there when you decide to implement benefit management uh, in your organization, even if you don't have one of the questions in the chat was about how how will we do it if we don't have a benefit manager or a benefit team in your organization. And this is where we want to ha really help you. We, if you need to get in contact with us and 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 have a chat with me. Um, I'm part of the of the hate PCA, and I'm really love to to he to hear from you. And if you have any kind of question, team that you want to or project that you want to start applying benefit, please let us know. And that is a that is part of the association as well. We are we are part of, of providing you with all of the tool, the framework, the theory, and all the consultancy that we can that you need we really want to be there on the time that you you want help and this workshop the basic training and and the intermediate that will help you whatever is your level of benefit or maturity of benefit in your organization so just let us know where you are what you need and um, we will help you about the uh, what, how to start and and that is from me and from David as well. Thank you so much for everybody to attending the 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 workshop today. You have the code for that little game, and please contact us if you need um, any help with benefits. Thank you. So